morning, church. Uh, I'll be reading in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 23 through 25. For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. And when he, when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Do this in remembrance of me. Or this is when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. We've read this passage many times, and we've heard the words, Do this in remembrance of me many times, yet how often have we failed to do so? How often do our minds wander during the Lord's Supper? When our minds aren't focused on Jesus during the Lord's Supper, we're not doing it in remembrance of him. We're eating bread and grape juice. So uh, whenever we partake of the Lord's Supper, uh, let's keep our minds focused on what it really needs to be focused on. Let, let it remind you of the death of Jesus, the suffering that he that he did for us, that he endured for us. Let it remind you of what he did for you and to share that news with others. You know, there's many things that the Lord's Supper can remind us of, so let's keep our minds focused on that. You bow your head with me, please. Our Father in heaven, we come to you in prayer. We want to thank you for Jesus, your son. We want to thank you that he came to earth and was tempted and died for us. Sinless, he was sinless, the perfect sacrifice, Father. We thank you for that. We pray that um, we would show others the love that, that he showed to us and that you would help us to keep our minds focused on what he did for us. We want to thank you um, for these emblems that represent his body and blood. And it's in Christ's name we pray, amen. Pray with me, please. <clears throat> Our Heavenly Father, as we continue with the Lord's Supper and, and uh, drink this fruit of the vine that that uh, represents the blood of Christ, we, we pray that, our, that we're mindful of the suffering that the Lord Jesus did for us, for us and how that, that blood delivers us from the, the bondage of sin. We thank you for your wonderful plan of salvation. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
This next song is page 166. He's my king. All day long of Jesus I am singing. He my song of joy will ever be. All the while he keeps my heart bells ringing. For his love is everything to me. He's my king and oh I dearly love him. He's my king, no other is above him. All day long in rapture praise I sing. He's my savior, he's my king. Streams of love around my soul are flowing. From his heart love's everlasting spring. That is why my faith in him I'm showing. That is why an endless song I sing. He's my king and oh I dearly love him. He's my king, no other is above him. All day long in rapture praise I sing. He's my savior, he's my king. In his light I'm going home to glory. With the souls who trust his saving grace. Going home to sing and tell his story In the blessed sunshine of his face He's my king and oh I dearly love him He's my king, no other is above him All day long in rapture praise I sing He's my Savior, he's my King. Okay, before the lesson this morning uh, is song number 452. Standing on the promises, and I think it would be a good thing if we would stand while we'd sing this, if you're able to. <clears throat> Standing on the promises of Christ my King, through eternal ages let his praises ring. Glory in the highest I will shout and sing. Standing on the promises of God, standing, standing, standing the promises of God, my Savior, standing, standing, I'm standing on the promises of God, standing on the promises that cannot fail, when the howling storms of doubt and fear assail. By the living word of God I shall prevail, standing on the promises of God. Standing, standing, standing on the promises of God, my Savior, standing, standing. I'm standing on the promises of God, standing on the promises of Christ the Lord, bound to him eternally by love's strong cord, overcoming daily with the Spirit's sword, standing on the promises of God, standing, standing, standing on the promises of God, my Savior, standing, standing, 
I'm standing on the promises of God. Standing on the promises I cannot fall. Listening every moment to the Spirit's call. Resting in my Savior as my all in all. Standing on the promises of God. Standing, standing, standing on the promises of God, my Savior. Standing, standing, I'm standing on the promises of God. You can be seated, please. Today's scripture is Mark 6, 1 through 6. Jesus left there and went to his hometown, accompanied by his disciples. When the Sabbath came, he began to teach in the synagogue, and many who heard him were amazed. Where did this man get these things? They asked. What's this, What's this wisdom that has been given him? What are these remarkable miracles he is performing? Isn't this the carpenter? Isn't this Mary's son and the brother of James, Joseph, Judas, and Simon? Aren't his sisters here with us? And they took offense at him. Jesus said to them, A prophet is not without honor except in his own town, among his relatives, and in his own home. He could not do any miracles there except lay his hands on a few people and heal them. He was amazed at their lack of faith. Then Jesus went around teaching from village to village. Good morning. We're blessed to uh, have Tiffany with us from Hayesville uh, with Cindy Atwood today, her friend. Uh, Hayesville is my hometown where I grew up, and so welcome, Tiffany. I want to welcome everybody this morning. Another beautiful Lord's Day. And when God, the eternal Word, became flesh and came to this earth, he was born into a carpenter's home. Jesus, our earthly father, was a carpenter by trade in the village town of Nazareth. And when Jesus began to proclaim that he was the Christ, beginning of his earthly ministry, when he came to his hometown, Nazareth, Matthew's account reads in Matthew chapter 13 verse 55 that the people of Nazareth said, Is not this the carpenter's son? You know, everybody knows everybody in towns. And everybody knew who Joseph was and knew his family and knew that he was a carpenter. And Jesus grew up learning the humble trade of being a carpenter. And when he came to his hometown, Nazareth, and in the synagogue began to teach and the miracles that he was performing there, the people of Nazareth said, Is not this the carpenter, the son of Mary? Are not his brothers and sisters in the list there with us here in Nazareth? Is not this the carpenter? Not only did he grow up in a carpenter's home, he himself grew up with that trade as a carpenter. And I want you to notice on your outline in the, in the introduction by Warren Wiersbe. Warren Wiersbe writes, This was not what the Jewish people expected at all. They thought that their Messiah would come as a great king and would be born in a palace. But he was born into a carpenter's home. 
He should have been a great soldier, a conqueror, who would deliver them from Rome. No, he came as a laborer. He came as a servant, the carpenter. The Lord Jesus Christ identified Himself with common people. He knew the dignity of honest labor. He knew what it was like to work, to be tired. When Jesus Christ came to this earth, He identified with all of us. The humble state of a carpenter's home. Jesus, His early years we read about from His birth at Bethlehem and at around the age of 12 of being, you know, being about His Father's business. But about from that period on to about the age of 30, the Scriptures are silent about His life. What we do know during those years, He was a carpenter. He worked alongside with Joseph. And Luke chapter 3 verse 23 tells us about the age of 30. He began to preach and proclaim that He was the Christ. Before that in Luke chapter 3 verse 21 and 22 says He came to the Jordan River to be baptized by John the Baptist. And then God acknowledged Him as His beloved Son. And then He began His earthly ministry. And He began to acknowledge that He was the Son of God. And so somewhere... To the age of 30, he begins his ministry. And the scriptures are silent about those years up to the age of 30, other than what we read of those few that I shared with. And I want you to think about this. Uh, Max Licato in his book, God Came Near, in a chapter of this book, Out of the Carpentry Shop, I'd like to read this, a few words from it. The heavy door creaked on its hinges as he pushed it open. With a few strides, he crossed the silent shop and opened the wooden shutters to a square shaft of sunshine that pierced the darkness, painting a box of daylight on the floor. He looked around the carpentry shop. He stood for a moment in the refuge of the little room that housed so many sweet memories. He balanced the hammer in his hand. He ran his fingers across the sharp teeth of the saw. He stroked the smoothly worn wood of the sawhorse. He had come to say goodbye. It was time for him to leave. He had heard something that made him know it was time to go. So he came one last time to smell the sawdust and lumber. Life was peaceful here. Life was so safe. Here he had spent countless hours of contentment. On this dirt floor he had played as a toddler while his father worked. Here Joseph had taught him how to grip a hammer. And on this workbench he had built his first chair. I wonder what his thoughts, what he thought as he took one last look around the room. Perhaps he stood for a moment at the workbench, looking at the tiny shadows cast by the chisel and shavings. Perhaps he listened as voices from the past filled the air. Good job, Jesus. Joseph, Jesus, come eat. Don't worry, sir. We'll get it finished on time. I'll get Jesus to help me. I wonder if he hesitated. I wonder if his heart was torn. I wonder if he rolled a nail between his thumb and fingers, anticipating the pain. It was in the carpentry shop that he must have given birth to his thoughts. Here, concepts of convictions were woven together to form the fabric of his ministry. You can almost see the tools of the trade in his words that he spoke. You can see the trueness of the plumb line as he called for moral standards. You can hear the whistle of the plane as he pleads for religion to shave away unnecessary traditions. You can picture the snugness of the dovetail 
as he demands loyalty in relationships. You can imagine him with a pencil and a ledger as he urges honesty. It was here that his human hands shaped the wood his divine hands had created. And it was here that his body matured while his spirit waited for the right moment, the right day. And now that day had arrived. I wonder if he wanted to stay. I could do a good job here in Nazareth. Settle down. Raise a family. Be a civic leader. I wonder because I knew he had already read the last chapter. He knew that the feet that would step out of that safe shadow of the carpentry shop would not rest until they had been pierced and placed on a Roman cross. You see, he didn't have to go. He had a choice. He could have stayed, but his heart wouldn't let him. If there was hesitation on the part of his humanity, it was overcome by the compassion of his divinity. He left because of you. He laid his security down with his hammer. He hung tranquility on the peg with his nail apron. He closed the window shutters on the sunshine of his youth and lock the door of comfort and ease of being anonymous. Since he could bear your sins more easily than he could bear the thought of your hopelessness, he chose to leave. It wasn't easy. Leaving the carpentry shop never has been. We don't even think about what Max shared there. What he must have thought when he came to the age of 30 and knowing it is now time to be rejected and to be killed and to walk out of the peaceful carpentry shop to head for a cross. I want us to see this morning the one who created the universe grew the tree that he would be nailed on. That is... Beyond my imagination, that's beyond my comprehension. He who created the universe grew the tree that he would be nailed upon. The Bible says in John chapter 1 verses 1 through 3, In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. And all things came into being by Him. And apart from Him, nothing has came into being which has come into being. The creator of the universe, Jesus Christ, the Son of God that came to this world in the flesh. Paul put it this way in Colossians chapter 1 and verse 16. In verse 16 of Colossians chapter 1, Paul says, For by Jesus all things were created, both in the heavens and on the earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, All things have been created by Him and for Him. The Creator of the universe grew the tree that He would be nailed upon. Now I wonder how many times Jesus carried a tree back to the carpentry shop and trimmed it, cured the wood, planed it, And while fashioning it into a table or a chair or some kind of farm implement was reminded of the tree that he would one day carry up that hill of Calvary and be nailed to. Jesus lived in the shadow of the cross. And he knew that there would be a day as he would step out of that carpentry shop and head to that cross to be nailed on it with hammer and nails, familiar tools that he used every day. Every day as a carpenter, Jesus used tools, hammers and nails. And I wonder how many times he thought about those nails being pierced through him for you and for me. Things we don't even think about. In John chapter 19, John records this of Jesus being led to be crucified in the John chapter 19. I 
I'd like to read in the 19th chapter, starting in verse 16. John chapter 19, starting in verse 16. John says, So then, so he then delivered him to them to be crucified. That's Pilate delivering Jesus to be crucified. Verse 17, They took Jesus therefore. He went out bearing his own cross to the place of the skull, which is called in Hebrew, Gogotha. And by the way, in Latin it's Calvary. Calvary is from the Latin and Gogotha is from the Jewish Aramaic, the Hebrew, which means the place of the skull. Verse 18, notice, There they crucified Him, and with Him two other men, one on either side, and Jesus in between. And Pilate wrote an inscription also and put it on the cross. It was written, Jesus the Nazarene, the King of the Jews. Therefore this inscription many of the Jews read, For the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city. It was written in Hebrew, Latin, and in Greek. And so the chief priests of the Jews were saying to Pilate, Do not write the king of the Jews, but that he said, I am the king of the Jews. Pilate answered, What I've written, I have written. Jesus went out bearing His own cross to Calvary, but because He had been beaten so unmercifully by the cat of nine tails that He was so marred that you couldn't even recognize Him as a man, He was so weak already at that point, being up all night with that mockery trial with no sleep and, and the sorrow of knowing that He's going to die for you and me. He couldn't even carry the cross. They had to pull Simon of Cyrene to be able to, to finish the job, to get that cross beam up on the hill of Calvary where Jesus would die for you and me. Above His head was put that inscription. The Romans crucified people. It wasn't to be a fast death. It was to be a slow, painful death. Two to three days a man could hang on the cross and die. It was to be a slow, painful death. And it was to be in a place where the crossroads were. People would travel and everybody would see it to make an example to keep you from committing the crime. And so in that realm, Jesus carried His own cross until He couldn't even bear it and dropped underneath it. But He carried that cross knowing that He was in the shadow of it and now the time was to be fulfilled to be nailed to it for you and for me. In Acts chapter 5, in Peter's sermon to the Jews in Jerusalem, in Acts chapter 5, notice what Peter says in verse 30 in this other sermon. The first sermon was in chapter 2, but in Acts chapter 5, here's another sermon by Peter. And in verse 30, Peter says by the Holy Spirit, The God of our fathers raised up Jesus, whom you put to death by hanging Him on a cross. By hanging him on a tree, on a tree, the NIV says, cross and tree are interchangeable. It's a one and the same. He was hung on a tree, a cross. First Peter chapter two verse twenty four says that he himself bore our sins, my sins, your sins, on the tree, on the cross. And so he took our sins in his body on the cross, on that tree. And He grew the tree, that very tree that He would be nailed to as the Creator of the universe that created all things. I want to see second. There was a tree in the heart of God before there was one planted on the green hill outside of Jerusalem. The tree in the heart of God, the cross was not a, an accident. God wasn't caught off guard when they rejected His Son and crucified Him. The cross was always in God's eternal plan before He ever made man. And that cross is God's plan of salvation, knowing giving man a free moral choice that man will sin and that we need salvation. And that cross was in God's eternal purpose. And I want you to go to Acts chapter 2 on the day in the birth of the New Testament church and that first sermon that Peter preached there in Acts chapter 2 as he was guided by the Holy Spirit. In Acts chapter 2, starting in verse 22, notice what Peter says to the Jews at Jerusalem. 
Men of Israel, listen to these words. Jesus the Nazarene, a man attested to you by God with miracles and wonders and signs, which God performed through Him in your midst, just as you yourselves know. This man, delivered up by the predetermined plan and foreknowledge of God, you nailed to the cross by the hands of godless men and put him to death. God raised him up again, putting an end to the agony of death, since it was impossible to be held in its power. Peter says that the cross was God's predetermined plan and foreknowledge. In 1 Peter chapter 1, Peter writes this in 1 Peter chapter 1, starting in verse 18. 1 Peter chapter 1 verse 18, Peter says, Knowing that you were not redeemed with perishable things like silver or gold from your futile, futile way of life inherited from your forefathers, but with precious blood as of a lamb, unblemished and spotless, the blood of Christ. For He was foreknown before the foundation of the world, but has appeared in these last times for your sake. The NIV, the NIV says, for He was chosen before the creation of the world. You see, the cross was always in God's eternal plan of sacrificing His Son for the penalty of sin that we could have forgiveness of sins. In Ephesians chapter 1, Paul writes to the Christians at Ephesus in Ephesians chapter 1. And in verse 4, Ephesians chapter 1 verse 4, Paul says, Just as He chose us in Him, God chose us in Christ before the foundation of the world. He chose us in Christ before the creation of the world. In the third chapter, he talks about this eternal purpose of Jesus in His church where Jesus would die. In verse 10, chapter 3 of Ephesians, in verse 10, and in order that the manifold wisdom of God might now be made known through the church the heaven, uh, to the rulers and the authorities in the heavenly places. Notice verse 11. This was in accordance with the eternal purpose which He carried out in Jesus Christ our Lord. And Paul wrote in 2 Timothy chapter 2, in 2 Timothy chapter 1, excuse me, in 2 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 9, 2 Timothy chapter 1 verse 9, Paul says that God saved us and called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to His own purpose and grace, which He granted us in Christ Jesus from all eternity. That cross was in the heart of God before that tree ever grew on the green hill outside of Jerusalem. Third, that middle tree was my tree. That middle tree was your tree. Isn't it fitting that Jesus... He would be named Jesus. Remember the angel telling Joseph, you'll call Him Jesus because it is He who will save His people from their sins. He would be called Jesus because it was He who would save His people from their sins. And Paul said it's a trustworthy statement deserving full acceptance that Christ Jesus came into this world to save sinners among whom I am chief. Jesus came to die for our sins. Romans 5, verse 6 through 8, Paul talks about God demonstrated His own love towards us and while we were still yet sinners, Christ died for the ungodly. For one will hardly die for a righteous man. Perhaps for a good man one would dare even to die. But God demonstrates His own love towards us and while we were still yet sinners, Christ died for us. Romans 6, 23 says the wages of sin is death. And yet Jesus was sinless. Righteous and just. But the just one died for the unjust. The righteous one died for the unrighteous. And that's why Paul said in 1 Corinthians 15 verse 3. He said, For I delivered unto you as first importance that which also I received, that Christ died for our sins. Jesus died for not His sins, 
but our sins. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21 says that God made Jesus who knew no sin to become sin on our behalf that we might become the righteousness of God through Him. That we might be made right with God when we come to be in Christ. The sinless one took my sins and your sins in His body on the cross. He died for our sins. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 24, He Himself bore our sins in His body on the cross, on the tree, so that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. For by His wounds you were healed. We're healed through the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. That middle cross was my cross. That middle tree was my tree. That middle cross and tree was your tree. And there Jesus died in our stead. And it's fitting that He would be called Jesus because He would save His people from their sins. It's fitting that He came to save us from our sins. It's fitting that He died between what? Two sinners. Two thieves representing sin. That's why He came. He came to die and save sinners like you and me. And He died in that middle tree as a substitute as a substitutionary sacrifice in my behalf and your behalf and for all men that would receive the blessing of the obedience to the gospel and the grace that was that precious blood that was shed that does bring us forgiveness. I want you to turn to the gospel of Mark chapter 8. Mark the 8th chapter. I'd like to begin in verse 22, Mark chapter 8, <clears throat> starting in verse 22. They came to Bethsaida, and they brought a blind man to him, and entreated him to touch him. And taking the blind man by the hand, he brought him out of the village, and after spitting on his eyes, Laying his hands upon him, he asked him, Do you see anything? He looked up and he said, I see men, for I am seeing them like trees walking about. Then again he laid his hand upon his eyes, and he looked intently and was restored and began to see everything clearly. And he sent him to his home saying, Do not enter. The village. I want you to notice on the outline there in the words of J. Moles. J. Moles writes this of this account. Here we find the case of the Bessadian patient, a blind man. We see that Dr. Jesus touched this man's eyes twice. Before continuing, I must ask, how many times did Dr. Jesus have to heal someone before they were completely healed? Once. Look over Dr. Jesus' patient files. Therefore, when Dr. Jesus touched this patient the first time in verse 23, the man could see perfectly. So what did he see? Verse 24 reads literally, I see these men that I behold as walking trees. Pause for a moment. Galatians chapter 3 verse 13 reads, Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law, having become a curse for us. For it is written, Cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree. The Bessadians saw these men for what they really were. The reason that Jesus would go to the cross as the ultimate sacrifice, the Lamb of God. These men were each and every one the cross that Jesus would bear. Once the Bessadian had seen this, Dr. Jesus touched him a second time. And we are told that the man was restored. The Greek word here literally means to put into former order. He was returned to normal vision for a short time. The Bessadian saw those men with God's eyesight. And I fully agree with what Jay writes here. You read the gospel accounts. 
When Jesus healed someone, they were immediately, folks, immediately healed. He did this for him to be able to see. And he saw men walking as trees. And I see in the midst of that my tree. I see in the midst of that your tree. I see in the midst of that of all of us. Of all men's tree. That Jesus went as a substitutionary death dying in our place. By His wounds we are healed. The penalty that was due to us, the stroke that was due to us, He bore on the cross at Calvary, Isaiah 53 says. And He died willingly and lovingly. You remember on the cross while He was hanging there and the... And the The crowds were shouting at him, if you be the Son of God, come down from there. Jesus could have come down. He could have called 12 legions of angels the Father would have put at his disposal. He didn't even have to even be nailed to the cross. Jesus said in John 10, verse 17 and 18, no man takes my life. I lay it down freely. And by that, Jesus lovingly, willingly let those nails be driven through His flesh willingly bore my sins and your sins and became sin that where God couldn't even look at Him for the first time He'd be separated from His Father. Where He'd cry out, My God, my God, why has Thou forsaken me? Because God couldn't look upon sin. And Jesus there lovingly, freely took my sins and your sins and bore in His body on the tree becoming sin for you and me. That's how much God loved each one of us. And here the Bethsaidians saw men walking as trees. We're all walking trees. But Jesus went to the cross and hung on that tree for you and me. It's interesting as the carpenter, born into a carpenter's home. When Jesus was born, He was laid in wood, right? A manger, a feeding trough made of wood. When he died, he was laid on a piece of wood, a tree where he died for you and me. And as the master builder, the master carpenter, on that tree, he built a bridge between God and man. The God who is holy and righteous and has been offended and we the sinner who have offended. Jesus built a bridge. The Bible says in 1 Timothy uh, chapter 2 verse 5, There's one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. Jesus built a bridge to reconcile us to a holy God that we've offended with our sins, to be made right. That's what He meant in John chapter 10 verse 9 when He said, I am the door and he who enters through me will be saved and you shall go in and out and find pasture. It's what he meant in John 14, verse 6, when he said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. You remember Jacob's dream of the ladder in Genesis 28, verse 11 and 12? That ladder that was at the foot rung from earth and went up into heaven to God. And then in that dream, Jacob hears God speak, I am the Lord, the God of your father Abraham, the God of your father uh, Isaac. He saw on that ladder in this dream angels of God ascending and descending on that ladder which pointed to Jesus. When Jesus met Nathanael in John chapter 1 in verse 51 He told Nathanael, He said, You'll see greater things than than these. You'll see the angels of God ascending and descending on the Son of Man. Because Jesus is that ladder, that bridge that way to God, to be made right. Jesus, as a carpenter, had a way with wood. When He was born, He was laid on a piece of, in a piece of wood. And when He died, He was laid on a piece of wood. Inside your bulletin, there's a poem there at the very left top page entitled, He Had a Way with Wood. The author and the source is unknown of this poem. But I want you to notice, He had a way with wood. He had a way with wood. The yokes he made were light. The plows he made were good. The joints firm, their handles right. He had a way with wood. He touched the cross's ugly span, barren and blood-stained where it stood, and built a bridge 
from God to man. The humble carpenter did that for you and for me. You must enter that door to find that reconciliation with God. You must enter through Christ to be saved from your sins. And Jesus invites all. He says, come to me all you are weary and heavy laden. You shall find rest for your souls. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me for I'm gentle and humble in heart. That rest for our souls is found in Jesus Christ. And we come to put Him on in baptism, washing away our sins. That precious blood of the unspotted, unblemished blood of the Lamb is what will wash away your sins and cleanse you making us right with God. If you're not in Christ, if you're not saved, if you don't have your sins washed away, won't you do that? We want to invite you to come to Christ because as the carpenter, carpenters build and repair things. And you think about this as the carpenter. Before he came to this earth, he built the universe. And when He came to this universe, He lived and died and and died on the cross carrying your sins in His body on that tree. He built His church. And now, after that death, burial, and resurrection, He sent it into heaven. He's gone to prepare a place for you and me in heaven when we come to be in Him. Let not your hearts be weary. Believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions or many dwelling places. If it were not so, I'd have told you. But I go to prepare a place for you. That where I am, there you may be also. The master builder, the carpenter, built the universe, built his church, and has prepared a place for you and me in Christ. If you be subject to the invitation this morning, if we can help you in any way, won't you come while we stand, while we sing? I've wandered far away from God, now I'm coming home. The paths of sin too long I've trod, Lord, I'm coming home, coming home, coming home, never more to Now's the time that we take up the collection. Uh, this, these funds are used for uh, many things. Um, the, over here, we're repairing the wall. Uh, there was termite damage. Uh, not too long ago, we had the carpets cleaned. Um, that takes money. We bought equipment to share uh, messages over the internet. That takes money. Uh, we support missionaries um, that further the, the uh, word of God. So there's many things that we do, um, and it just it just takes funds. So let's uh, let's give to God um, a portion of what He's given us. Can you pray with me, our Father in heaven. We want to thank you for the many blessings that you give to us, and 
Uh, we want to thank you for the many opportunities that you give us to, to help others and to spread your word and to serve you, Lord. Um, we pray that, that we would give with generous hearts and uh, that these funds could be used uh, in the best way possible and that, uh, that uh, many people could uh, come to you. And it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. I have several announcements this morning. Uh, most of them are additions to the prayer list. Uh, Christy's Lee, Christy Lee's dad broke his hip yesterday, and uh, he's in, in Pratt, and they're doing surgery on him this morning. Okay, thank you. Did everybody hear that? His surgery's over, and he went came through it fine. Um, Christy Stevens... Granddad Jerry Oliver has been diagnosed with cancer in his back. So we need to add him to the prayer list. And Treva Brensing's dad, Joe Tarbert, is very ill with bronchitis and a weak heart. And then Sandy said J.D. and Gala Redger's baby had heart surgery a few days ago, and he's still intensive care and is having several complications from that so we need to add those to the to the prayer list is there anything else that any other announcements okay We'll add him to the prayer list, too. Um, and we also, we need to have a men's business meeting up front here after this service. So, uh, let's have our closing prayer now. During Russell's sermon, when he said that the that middle tree was for me, I was back there thinking, I'm not even worthy of a tree, more like a pile of dead weeds. But um, I'm, I'm really thankful for what the Lord has done. Let us pray. Lord, thank you for this day. Thank you for the roof over our head, soles on our feet, food in our stomachs, and places to sleep. Help us to live by your expectations and not ours. Help us to be a servant like the carpenter, building up our lives and the lives of others around us. As you identified with us in the flesh, help us to sympathize with those around us that are having troubles, troubles and lift them up. Thank you for dying for the unjust, such as I. Have mercy on all of us, for we are sinners. Bless the food today and the hands that prepared it. In your name we pray. Amen. <laughs>